Welcome to this tutorial from the NCVS. I'm Brad Storey, a professor in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences at the University of Arizona. This tutorial is a brief explanation of vocal tract resonances and their associated standing waves, specifically as they relate to vowel production. Typical production of vowels is based on vibration of the vocal folds providing a sound source that is filtered by the acoustic characteristics of the vocal tract. The sound that radiates at the lip opening contains information of both the source and filter. An example spectrum of a voice source signal is shown here. It contains a fundamental frequency component and many harmonics whose amplitudes decrease as a function of increasing frequency. An example spectrum of the output pressure at the lip opening is shown here. It contains exactly the same fundamental frequency component and harmonics, except that their amplitudes have been modified by the filtering effect of the vocal tract. A spectral envelope is a curve that encompasses the amplitudes of the harmonics in a spectrum. A spectral envelope has been constructed for both the source spectrum and output spectrum. The source spectral envelope indicates the decrease in harmonic amplitudes as frequency increases, whereas the envelope of the output spectrum clearly shows distinct regions or peaks where the harmonic energy has been enhanced relative to other regions. These regions of the spectrum with enhanced energy are called formants or formant frequencies and result from the acoustic effect of the vocal tract on the source spectrum. To better understand how the vocal tract enhances the source spectrum, it is often easiest to begin by imagining the vocal tract to be a simple tube of uniform cross-section extending from the vocal folds to the lips. The tube is considered to be closed at the end closest to the larynx and open at the lips. The vibration of the vocal folds does open and close the glottis, that is the airspace between the vocal folds, at the closed end to inject sound into the vocal tract. The size of the glottal opening, however, is small compared to the cross-section of the vocal tract, and there is potentially much time during each vocal fold vibratory cycle that the glottis is actually closed. Both of these conditions motivate the use of a closed open tube as a model of the vocal tract. Note also that the nearly 90 degree bend in an actual vocal tract is not represented by the uniform tube. Although the bend is bio biomechanically significant for providing an efficient means of deforming the tube shape during speech, it is of much less significance from an acoustic perspective. The average vocal tract length for an adult male is about 17 and a half centimeters. A closed open uniform tube of this specific length can be characterized acoustically by the frequency response function shown here. The frequency response function, or sometimes called a transfer function, is not a spectrum of a particular sound, but rather indicates the effect that the uniform tube would have on any frequency component of a sound propagating through it. The peaks in the frequency response function correspond to the resonances or natural frequencies of the particular tube configuration, and they can be considered the origin of the formant frequencies. That is, the resonances of the vocal tract enhance the amplitudes of particular regions of frequencies. When a sinusoidal wave with a frequency matched to the first resonance of the uniform tube is injected through a tiny aperture at the closed end, a standing wave is produced within the tube that extends along its length. In the case shown here, the frequency of the input sinusoid is 500 hertz, the same frequency as the first tube resonance. The acoustic pressure along the tube length is shown as a variation in color. The deepest red indicates large positive pressure, the deepest blue indicates large negative pressure, and light green represents zero or atmospheric pressure. The plot just above the tube also indicates pressure along the tube length but is shown as a traditional two-dimensional plot 
of pressure versus distance from the closed end or glottis. Although the input frequency is 500 hertz, the animation is shown in extreme slow motion so that the pressure variations can be visually tracked. Note that the pressure oscillates between large positive values to large negative values at the closed end, and tapers to zero at the open end. That is, the closed end provides containment of the air and allows for a buildup of pressure, whereas at the open end, the pressure must become equal to the atmospheric pressure, which is zero. These are known as boundary conditions that determine the pattern of pressure variation that can be reinforced by the specific configuration of the tube. When the input frequency is aligned with the first resonance of a closed open tube, the standing wave produced is one quarter of the wavelength. For this reason, closed open tubes are sometimes referred to as a quarter wave resonator or a quarter wave tube. In this case, a sinusoidal wave with a frequency matched to the second resonance of the uniform tube is injected at the closed end, again producing a standing wave. This time, however, the pattern is different. There are now two regions along the vocal tract length at which the pressure oscillates between large positive and negative pressures, and two regions at which the pressure remains at zero. The regions with zero pressure are located one-third of the length of the tube, and also at the lips. Even though the pattern is different, the boundary conditions at the closed and open ends of the tube are met, just as in the previous animation. In this case, three-quarters of the wavelength comprise the standing wave. In this case, a sinusoidal wave with a frequency matched to the third resonance of the uniform tube is injected at the closed end, producing a standing wave with three zero pressure nodes. The pattern of pressure is different than the two previous animations, but again the boundary conditions at the closed and open ends of the tube are met. For comparison to the previous standing wave animations, the sinusoidal wave injected at the closed end in this case has a frequency, 750 hertz, that is not aligned with a resonance. A standing wave is not produced at this frequency. Rather, the amplitude of the input sound is highly attenuated as it propagates in the tube. The boundary condition of zero pressure at the open end of the tube is an idealization. In reality, the section of air in vibration at the lips transmits a small amount of acoustic energy that radiates outward away from the end of the tube. While typically far less than 1% of the total energy produced during speech or singing, this is the sound that is actually heard by a listener. This correction also slightly increases the effective length of the tube and results in a lowering of each resonance frequency as can be seen in the frequency response function. Standing waves corresponding to each of the first three resonances of the uniform tube will be shown again, but with the correction for sound radiation. The patterns of pressure variation appear to be nearly identical to those in the idealized cases. The difference is simply that the frequencies at which the standing waves occur are slightly lower than before. Note that in each case, the upward and downward movement of the small black dot at the right side of each pressure plot indicates the radiated pressure.
Although the uniform tube is useful for understanding the basic acoustics of the vocal tract, it is not a realistic configuration. In these two cases, the uniform tube will morph into a tubular version of an E vowel on the left and an A vowel on the right, both of which were measured from a real person using magnetic resonance imaging. As the vocal tract shape changes, the corresponding frequency response functions will also change. The deformation of the uniform tube into realistic vocal tract configurations shifts the resonance frequencies upward or downward into a pattern that is representative of each respective vowel. Standing waves will now be demonstrated for the first three resonances of the vowels E and A. Ah. The first resonance of this particular E vowel is 227 Hz. As can be seen, however, the standing wave associated with this frequency is similar to the standing wave observed for the first resonance of the uniform tube, which had a frequency of 500 Hz. That is, the pressure oscillates between large positive and large negative values in the back portion of the vocal tract and tapers to nearly, but not quite, zero at the lips. The difference is that the pressure variation along the vocal tract length is modified by the expansions and constrictions that form the E configuration. The first resonance of this particular A vowel is 811 Hz, but again, the standing wave associated with this frequency is similar to the standing wave observed for the first resonance of both the uniform tube and the E vowel. Pressure variation along the vocal tract length, however, is modified by the constrictions and expansions that form the A configuration. The standing waves for the second and third resonances of the E and A vowels will now be played consecutively. Watch carefully for similarities in locations of zero pressure and differences of pressure amplitudes in other regions of the vocal tract. You may have observed that the locations of zero pressure, or nodes, is quite similar for standing waves associated with each resonance, even though the frequency of those resonances is quite different due to the specific vocal tract configuration. As we produce speech or sing, the shape of the vocal tract undergoes almost continuous change in order to shift the frequencies at which standing waves will be supported. This allows for easy passage of those frequency components aligned with a resonance through the vocal tract system and to the outside world. The continual change in the frequency bands that are enhanced or suppressed by this process is the means by which talkers encode a message that is transmitted to a listener. All of the examples shown thus far have been based on a vocal tract length of 17.5 centimeters. As mentioned previously, this is a typical length of an adult male vocal tract. For comparison, a typical length of an adult female vocal tract is about 15.5 centimeters, whereas a two-year-old child has a vocal tract that is about 10.5 centimeters long. This animation shows the frequency response function of the uniform tube as the length is shortened from 17.5 to 10.5 centimeters. As can be observed, the shortening of vocal tract length systematically increases the frequency of each resonance. 
had shorter vocal tracks been used for animating the standing waves at each resonance frequency, the patterns of pressure variation along the vocal tract would have appeared essentially the same. The difference would simply be that the standing waves occur at higher frequencies. This concludes the tutorial on vocal tract resonances and their associated standing waves.